Thank you everyone for attending our virtual lunch discuss discussion with C-Sales Ronit Rubenfeld. Uh, I ask that you please send me any questions for Roni in the chat and I will ask on your behalf at the conclusion of the presentation. And with that, I wanna hand things over to Roni. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the research I've been doing for the last several years on something called local computation algorithms. So let's see, so this, all right, I'm not changing, something is not a, oh, here we go, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so what the research I've been doing actually for the past maybe even 30 years is what happens when you have super large inputs, so large that you don't have time to look at all the input before you need to make a decision. And for most of that time, we've been looking at estimating parameters of the inputs or trying to see if it has a certain property, like maybe we wanna know, um, does a very large graph, is it possible to cluster most of it into a small number of clusters? Or is it, um, is it is a large set of, of data, is your data set essentially alphabetized? Um, but I don't care, I don't need to know that it's perfectly alphabetized, it would be enough for me to know that most of it is alphabetized. Um, so I'm interested in just one word answer, is it or isn't it? Yes, no. Okay, so that kind of question. Or I may want to know an estimate on something like the vertex cover of the graph. So that would be just a number. Okay, but today what I want to talk about is what happens when not only do we have large inputs, but we also have large outputs. Okay, so here, the output for the computational problem that I'm trying to solve is huge. It's just as huge as the input, maybe larger, maybe only a little bit smaller. Okay, but I don't have time to write it all down. So maybe I'm in this situation where the computational problem I'm trying to solve is huge, but I only need to know a piece of it. For example, uh, maybe we're doing tennis court scheduling and I don't need to know how everybody was scheduled to the tennis courts. I just need to know when do I play? What time and what, what court do I go to? So I don't need to see the whole answer. I just need to see my piece. And when that's the case, do I need to actually compute the whole answer or can I just compute my piece of the answer? And in particular, to do that, to compute my piece of the answer, do I need to see everybody's requests or can I just see my requests and maybe a few other people's requests? Okay, so I'm going to, just to make this a little more concrete, um, I'm going to talk about a specific problem, the maximal independent set problem. Here, you're given an undirected graph, um, so you've got nodes. Uh, you could think of these as people, and you've got edges, so the edges between, let's say, people that know each other, or um, we'll see another example in a minute. Uh, and what we want is an independent set. An independent set is a subset of the nodes such that no two vertices are connected by an edge. Okay, so these red guys are an independent set because no two red nodes are connected by an edge. Okay, and what we're interested in are large independent sets. In particular, I want either a maximum independent set, which is the largest size independent set. And um, for those of you that know about this, that, that's NP hard to find. Um, um, and what I'm interested in here is a maximal independent set. This is a bit easier to find. This is just an independent set that may not be the largest one, but I can't add any nodes to it. So for example, in this one here, I cannot add any of the yellow nodes to this independent set because each yellow node already is linked to some red node. So if I add this guy here, uh, let's see, whoops, that was not. If I add this guy here, I can't because, um, because, because he knows this one here, okay? And it's true for any yellow node. Uh, this one is next to a red node. These, all of these yellow nodes are next to a red node. I cannot add any of them, okay? So, um, now perhaps, what is the question we want to ask here? What we want to ask is, is node U in the maximal independent set? And I'd like to figure this out without looking at the whole interconnection network, okay? So this is something that actually happened to me in real life. Um, so think of a graph of seats, okay? So um, let's say these are, each one of these is a seat in a classroom, okay? Now, normally when I teach in a classroom, um, people, all the students can sit wherever they want. 
And then they can sit wherever it's convenient for them. They can sit next to each other. They can sit far apart from everybody else, whatever they prefer, and watch the lecture. But when I'm giving an exam, I don't want two people to sit where they can copy from each other. So I can't have them sitting next to each other, and I can't have them sitting in two seats that might be in the same line of sight, okay? So I'm gonna put these edges mean that these, these two seats should, um, I can sit either here or here, but not both. I can't have a student in both those locations. All right, so what happens is when students come into the classroom, 300 students come into this big classroom, they're not all gonna fit. We need to seat them as quickly as possible um, down in locations so that as few as possible people have to go to the overflow room. And they're coming in like crazy and they want to sit in some seat and I have to know, can I let them sit in the seat of their choice or do I have to move them over by one or two? Okay, so this is something I have to do fast. Me and the whole course staff, there's like 15 of us, we're seating these people as fast as we can and we don't have time to talk to each other. Okay, so we have to decide somehow, is this node U an okay place for a person to sit? Okay, all right, so that's the goal. Um, maximal independent set isn't really just for deciding where people can sit during an exam is, or for deciding uh, people that don't know each other. It's a central problem in computer science. It's an important as an optimization tool. It's used in task scheduling. It's one of the most studied problems in distributed computing because it answers questions of the following type. Um, can I broadcast over the distributed network without conflicting with my neighbors? Uh, it's also considered um, relevant to a fruit fly brain development question. So some work of people uh, affect it all showed that a, in the fruit fly, um, the cells in the brain specialize so that some of the cells become leader cells. And what you want is that the leader cells shouldn't be next to each other um, because too many cooks spoil the broth, but you do want all the cells to be near some leader cell. And it seems that the fruit fly does follow a maximal independent set type algorithm in deciding which nodes become the lead, which cells become the leader cells. Okay, so this is a problem that's so fundamental uh, that it's all over the place. And moreover, the tools that I'm going to talk about today have, um, which were developed for maximal independent set, have been useful for many other optimization problems. So there's nothing really special about applying these tools to maximal independent set. It's just that it's a simple problem to talk about while I show you the ideas. Okay, so there's a model that we developed for local computation algorithms. Here we have a super big input. It's really huge. You can't see it all, um, but it's written down. And we're going to assume that the algorithm has random access to this input. So it can look at location I, it can look at location J, and we're just going to charge one step. Okay, so this is just, I'm going to assume this is huge, but I can reach any piece of it in one step. The output, however, is not written down anywhere. This is just sort of in your dreams, and this is what you want to compute. All right. So there's a local computation algorithm. It's really a type of a query processing machine where you send queries to it. You know, I ask, okay, what is the value of the output at location 10? Okay, and it'll make some queries. It'll make what we'll call probes to the input. I want to distinguish probes to the input from queries to the local computation algorithm. So it'll probe the input in certain locations um, wherever it needs to in order to figure out what's the value of the output at location 10 and it'll output y sub 10. Then there might be another query. So the next query might ask about location 22. Uh, the local computation algorithm will make more probes to the input and try to figure out what is the value of the output at location 22 and so on. Okay, so that's the model. The difficulty is there may be more than one legal out, well, a difficulty is there may be more than one legal output. So for example, there are many, many maximal independent sets. So um, any node could be in potentially in some maximal independent set. So uh, how do you answer these things? You know, you could just say yes to everything. Um, maybe you should, maybe every time you ask if, if something's in the maximal dependent set, you should just say yes. But the problem is, just as when we were, um, when I was in the class with the TAs and we had no time to talk to each other, 
Uh, you could think of swarms of local computation algorithms. So you could think of the input being up in the cloud. So the input X is something up in the cloud. These local computation algorithms do not have time to talk to each other, but they can access the cloud. Um, they may not even know of the existence of the other copies of the local computation algorithm. They may go out into the world with some initial sharing of a short, possibly random string um, that helps them to compute. But once they start computing, they don't get to talk to each other. So this is not distributed computation at all, um, even though they're all working at the same time. Um, and you know, the first LCA may be asked questions about this area of the input, and this LCA may be asked about this area of the input and everybody and some of the areas may overlap, some of the areas may not overlap, but we need to provide the illusion of a fully constructed output. So whatever everybody answers needs to be consistent. And if there's overlapping areas, they have to be consistent with each other. So whatever I said for this thing has to be similar with, has to be the same as what my neighbor said is the output over here too. Okay. so even though there may be many possible outputs, we all have to agree on our answers when we're at, um, for a specific output, okay? All right, now the hope is we can do this all with sublinear time and space. And in particular, that means that we don't, we're not really able to remember our past decisions. Okay, so if I said, okay, you can use this seat, um, well, my neighbor also has to know that that seat got used. Okay, so so the other LCA, all the other LCAs need to know that that seat got used and remember that I don't get to talk to them. So somehow we have to agree in advance on a procedure that we'll be using so that nobody actually has to remember anything because we can't transmit information. All right, so I just want to say before I get into the examples is quite a few problems have been considered in this model in the last 10 years. Uh, starting with maximal independence, that there's a lot of work on that, but also many other optimization problems such as max matching, vertex cover, broadcast scheduling, uh, colorings of graphs and hypergraphs, set cover, logical problems such as uh, is there a satisfying assignment for a conjunctive normal form. Um, it's been used in algorithmic game theory for mechanism design. Uh, it's been used in online algorithms. Uh, so there's a number of problems, and in all of these particular cases that I've mentioned, um, you can get algorithms for local computation algorithms, which are consistent, and use only polylogarithmic probes. And I'm just saying these are sequential, so that's a lot less than linear, uh, and uh, it's a big savings. Okay, so what I want to talk about for the rest of the talk is how might we design such good local computation algorithms. And I just want to give it a high level some of the ideas that we use. The first idea is we're going to use distributed algorithms. Okay, so distributed algorithms come to the rescue. And you may say, I just said this isn't a distributed model. So that's kind of crazy because these, these local computation algorithms are very sequential. Okay, they're very fast, but they're very sequential. They don't get to talk to the other local computation algorithms. So why would distributed algorithms be helpful at all? So to answer that, First, I need to say what a distributed algorithm is, because this is, was not obvious to me when I first started looking at distributed algorithms. First of all, distributed algorithms, they compute on themselves as input. Okay, so I, if I have the connectivity network of the distributed, that the distributed algorithm is operating on, that's a graph. They're solving problems on the graph of their own connectivity network. So when the distributed algorithm is solving maximal independent set, it's because they want to figure out how they can broadcast so that no node broadcasts and collides with its neighbors. So I want to make sure that I broadcast, but none of my neighbors broadcast. And that's why I need a maximal independent set. Okay, so, so that's first of all. The input isn't written off in space somewhere. I mean, in our case, the written is written, the input is written down and we can access it. For the distributed networks, the, their interconnectivity network is the input. Okay, so the only way they can find out about their neighbor's neighbor is to ask their neighbor. They don't have random access. Okay, so it's a bit limited, their model. Um, and I'm going to talk about a certain model in distributed algorithms called the local model, where they have rounds. And in each round, what you get to do is send a message to your neighbor, receive a message from your neighbor, and do some computation. 
next round, send another message, receive another message, do some more computation. Okay, good. Now let's say you have a K round distributed algorithm for the maximal independent set problem. Okay, well, now I wanna claim that V's output can only depend on inputs and computations that are at a distance at most K, radius K, in the ball around V. Okay, why would that be? Let's say I have a one round distributed algorithm. What can I do? Okay, well, I do some computation, I send a message to my neighbor, and I receive a message from my neighbor. Now, that neighbor had to send me a message without hearing from his neighbors at all, right? So the only thing I can know is the name of my neighbor and the structure, like maybe how what his degree is, maybe the name of his neighbors, but I can't know anything about his neighbors, okay? Now, in the second round, my neighbor could have received information from his neighbors and in the first round and then sent it to me in the second round. So by the second round, I could get information on anybody that's two steps away, okay? And so on, by K, by K steps, by K rounds, I can get information from anybody that's K steps away from me, so K radius ball around me, but I can't hear from anybody further. Okay, so that's um, interesting. So that means that from the whole big graph, I can only depend on this small yellow area. Uh, and what's interesting about that is, okay, there exists a K-round distributed algorithm. I am not actually gonna compute it with a distributed network. I, as a sequential algorithm, can figure out all these inputs. Remember, the sequential algorithm gets random access. So he can go read all the information. This is just some big, let's call it an adjacency list representation of this graph and figure out all the values of this adjacency list representation in D to the K probes, okay? Because um, in a K radius ball, when I have degree at most D in my graph, um, I have at most D to the K uh, neighbors at radius K, okay? So that's, so the point is we can simulate everything sequentially. All right, the problem is this could be bad. Notice that it's exponential in K. So this would be fine if K is really small, but if K is big, this is not helpful at all. Okay, but we, this is what we're gonna use. All right, the beauty is local distributed algorithms have been giving constant round algorithms for many interesting problems. And there's been fantastic problem, progress in local distributed algorithms. So if we go back here and think of K as being a constant, then this means we can read or simulate everything in order D to the constant many probes. Um, and D to the constant is just, you know, if my degree is small compared to the number of nodes in the graph, it's gonna be tiny compared to the size of the graph. Okay, so we don't need a lot of time. All right, so we're going to be basically one of the main techniques in local computation algorithms is to use techniques from local distributed algorithms. All right, so what about maximal independent set? Well, there's a log n round algorithm uh, due to Luby. That was one of the first ones. The problem is that gives us, if we put plug log n into our d to the log n, that gives us a local computation algorithm, which is not even better than linear. So it, this ends up being n to the log d instead of so that's worse than linear. Uh, so this is not gonna do it for us. But, the, but what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna use distributed algorithms to sort of what we call shatter the graph um, into small pieces. Okay, so the broad outline of distributed maximal independent set algorithms are all nodes start out live, and then in each round, okay, everybody tosses a coin, um, and we're good. I'm gonna look at my coins and my neighbor's coins, and I'm gonna use the coins in the interaction with my neighbor to decide whether I should join the maximal independent set. Okay, so in one example, I'm gonna to toss a coin with a very small probability. If it comes up heads, then I'm gonna be a candidate. And if none of my neighbors came up heads, okay, so we all tossed with a very small probability. If none of my neighbors came up heads, then safe, I can just join the maximal independent set. Okay, uh, there are other algorithms as well, but if, I join the maximal independent set, then we just say I, I die because for the rest, I don't need to compute anymore for the rest of the computation. I know I'm in the maximal independent set. Furthermore, my neighbors, they die too because they're next to me. So they cannot go into the maximal independent set. So they also die, okay? So every ro round, somebody, jo whoever joins, joins. Whoever's around them 
um, can't be in the maximal ind independent set anymore. All these guys, they're decided from now on, they will say die because they don't have to work anymore. Okay, usually what we do is we repeat for in distributed computation, we repeat this until all the nodes are dead. Okay, and that usually takes log n rounds. What we're gonna do here is just repeat until a constant fraction of the nodes are dead. And that's just a constant number of rounds. That's all we need. Okay, so it turns out that after you run this, a constant number of rounds, say all these red nodes um, join the maximal independence set and all the green nodes are neighbors of, okay, actually, yeah, are neighbors of someone that joined the maximal independence set. So the reds are in the maximal independence set. The greens cannot be in the maximal independence set because they're next to somebody. So all those guys are dead. And the only ones we have that are left are these guys here. So these guys are alive. And what's interesting about these is it's not gonna be left with a huge component. We're gonna, what we can show is all the remaining live components are small. Like something like polylogarithmic in the sides of the graph. And so we can solve the remaining components via brute force. Okay, so we're basically using the distributed algorithm to shatter the graph into small, small, small pieces. And then we can do something very brute force on what's left. And Bill, based on this, we can design an algorithm. Okay, so what, um, so this was a technique and has been improved quite a bit with additional ideas. There has been a lot of work um, on improving these types of algorithms and I'll get into the precise bounds uh, soon. Um, but I just wanted to mention, um, I wanted to mention two things. One is I wanna mention that a lot of these people here are actually people that work in distributed algorithms. Uh, so what happened is uh, the ideas from local computation algorithms um, ended up helping in distributed, al distributed algorithms as well. So it's not just that our community used distributed algorithms, it's also the case that a distributed algorithms community started using ideas from local computation algorithms. And in fact, um, many of the more recent papers, when they give their results, they give the results in both models, both distributed and local computation. So it's been sort of a merging of two communities. And now we essentially think our, of ourselves as a single community um, to some extent. Okay, I wanna mention one other idea for constructing local computation algorithms. There's a bunch of ideas, but uh, these are two biggies. Um, and that's to simulate what the greedy algorithm would do. Okay, so, the sequential linear, more than linear time greedy algorithm, what does it do? It runs through the nodes in some order and it puts a node in the maximal independent set if none of the neighbors have been put in the maximal independent set until now. Okay, so it just processes each node and says, can I put you in? If I can, I will. If I can't because some neighbor has been in there, then I, I won't put you in the maximal independent set. So it's really just doing like, it's really like saying for those students that come in, if the chair is open and nobody's sitting in one of the neighboring chairs, have a seat. You know, I'm not trying to do some kind of global idea. All right, the problem with, um, so now what we want is to figure out what would greedy do on a particular node U, and that's what the local computation algorithm should do. And we might ask, why not just check if the neighbors are in or out? The problem is we don't actually know, because remember that a, we can't we can't use memory and we can't store information because we need to be consistent with other LCAs that may be operating independently. Okay, so for example, when I make a decision and I tell a student where they can sit, um, there may be 15 other TAs that are telling other students where to sit. And if we have a collision, that's kind of bad. Okay, so we can't, we, this would require communication between the local computation algorithms and they may not even know that the other ones exist. I mean, they, we're, we're thinking of a setting in which these local computation algorithms have zero interaction. They may not even know about the existence of the other ones, okay? So what we need to do, what we're gonna do is simulate the results of the sequential greedy algorithm. And we're gonna figure out what would the sequential greedy algorithm have done for all the adjacent edges or nodes. Um, and note that we only need to worry about those edges and nodes that were determined previously in the order. We ran through the nodes in some order, and now um, I know that anybody that came after me in the order 
hasn't been determined yet. I only need to figure out what happened with nodes that came before me in the order. So I'm just basically assuming everybody was given some numbering, okay? Everybody gets a unique number and I just, and we're gonna assume that we run through the nodes in the order according to those numbers. And I just need to look at the smaller numbers. Those nodes next to me, they have a smaller number, okay? The problem is, if I ask my neighbor that has a smaller number, were you put in the in maximal independent set? If I try to figure that out, um, then um, in order to figure that out, I may need to look at my neighbor's neighbor and figure out if that neighbor was put in the maximal independent set. And then I may need to look at my neighbor's neighbor's neighbor and figure out was that one put in the maximal independent set. And I may need to go on for a long time. So these dependency chains can be really long and it's, um, you know, we can come up with examples where this, it really is the case. Um, but the work of Nguyen and Onak, um, they were students at MIT, showed that actually most nodes are okay if the order is random. Okay, so then, so it says that for most nodes, we don't have to go through long dependency chains to figure out if it's going to be in the maximal independent set or not. Uh, we need more than most and we can get more than most um, and that's kind of more work. Okay, so how fast can these local computation algorithms be? Well, in terms of dependence on n, it's polylogarithmic in n, uh, and even there is a result showing that you can get log star in n, which is a really, really tiny function of n. It's basically, for most practical purposes, log star is like five. You know, it's a really tiny function. It's almost constant. In terms of the degree, most of these algorithms I mentioned have exponential dependence on the degree. Uh, the early algorithms and an open question that's been around since, you know, for 10 years is can we get polynomial dependence on the degree? And in fact, we're getting closer and closer to a yes answer there. Uh, some quite rec in recent years, we've been getting almost down to polynomial in the degree dependence. Uh, and for example, I believe this result is about a year old, this one right here, the Gafari Wito result. Okay, so what are some next steps? Um, we're looking at techniques for high degree graphs. How can you thin them uh, and sparsify them so that your processing can go much faster? Even though you have a high degree, if you bring it down to lower degree, then being um, exponential in, in very low degree isn't so bad. Uh, what other problems can we solve in this model? Many problems we've looked at, in addition to the ones I mentioned, are how to sparsify graphs while maintaining connectivity properties um, in, in various settings, how to generate random colorings, other random objects, uh, and lots of other problems. So this is a fairly new area with a lot of recent interest, um, and uh, there's a lot of exciting results and a lot of exciting colleagues to work with. Uh, so here are some example references. Um, this is by no means um, comprehensive uh, in the area. And that's, I'm ready to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ronit. That was very informative. Um, one question I have is, you know, if you could talk about any ways that some of these algorithms could be applied to our industry partners. Okay, so, so one place where this is, um, has been considered is in algorithmic game theory, for example. Uh, so a, they're looked at um, how to generate a various quantities that you need for auctions in such a way without seeing everybody's inputs. So that would be one possible uh, direction. Um, many of these local computation algorithms have been you have been useful for figuring out scheduling pro problems where I want to figure out my piece of the schedule um, in a way that's consistent with everybody else, but without actually generating a full comprehensive schedule. Uh, and those are two examples. Uh, I'm, um, it's a fairly new area, so there haven't been tons of results in industry yet, but um, we're look we're always looking for possibilities. Awesome, thank you. Have you seen this algorithm applied to areas you wouldn't have expected or used in a way you hadn't thought of? Yeah, one, actually one place where they got used were, was in um, 
in computational learning theory, um, so in machine learning, uh, there were algorithms that needed to guess what an adversary would do so that they could beat the adversary. So again, it's, it's a little bit of a, it's a competitive adversarial scenario. Um, and they had, to, in order to figure out what the adversary's best option would be, they used such local computation algorithms. So that was one surprising place. And that's it. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Ernie. Um, Actually, we have one other example. Oh, okay. One other possibility is, uh, so such algorithms have been used for local decompression algorithms. So for example, if you had huge gene bank banks um, of DNAs and you wanted to compute some um, statistical uh, computation on the gene banks um, and it's compressed. Okay, so the gene bank is very compressed um, and you may, and what, what do you do now? Do you need to decompress the whole gene bank in order to do your statistical computation? Or can you just decompress the pieces that you need in order to figure out um, what information to give your statistical algorithm? Okay, and there are local decompression algorithms that work in this model, um, which allow you to just decompress the pieces that you need. So that's another example of where it could be used in industry. There's lots of examples, I think, but uh, it's always hard to do the matching uh, between theory and practice. Um, so that's why we like to give these talks. That's Absolutely, thank you. Um, one question um, that just came in, if you could talk a little bit more about the application for auctions. Yeah, so that's actually not my area of expertise. It's not my result, um, but I can give a, um, I, offline I can give a reference to that one. Um, but, it, okay. it's, uh, but I'd be happy to give that reference. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that we are just about time to wrap up, but I want to thank you so much, Ronit, for your time uh, this afternoon um, thank you to meet me. virtually. Um, and we really appreciate your taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for attending.